Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Emily Morris, uh, founder and CEO of Emergy. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you to talk about um, a renewable topic that isn't exactly the sexiest or most popular, as we see a lot of solar and wind, as we all know, um, hydropower. Um, but I'm super excited to be uh, talking about this topic with you all and introducing you to Emergy's um, concept. Um, Without further ado, I assume everyone in here is familiar with conventional hydropower, like the, like the image here. Um, I know I met some folks already tonight that own and operate their own hydropower systems. Can I get a show of hands of anyone who's actually operating or dealing with, you know, hands-on with hydropower? A couple of us? Okay, well... We all should know or should, um, should acknowledge you know, hydropower being the oldest, the most uh, oldest form of renewable energy and um, many other really attractive attributes of, about hydropower. It's the most reliable, it's the most continuous, it's the most controllable form of renewable energy. Um, it allows us to have a resilient power system, which is why it's the backbone of national electric grids all over the world. Um, and you know, a hydroelectric like this is really the basis for what has spawned you know, the industrial and other technological revolutions um, of, of our recent history. Um, so hydropower is great. We should be building more and more of it, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, we're not building a lot of dams like the ones you see here anymore. As we probably know in this room, they can be very environmentally uh, destructive. Um, in fact, there's uh, many different um, campaigns for reducing the number of dams around the country. Um, they can be very expensive to build a very large facility like this. It can take, on average, over 12 years from ideation to commissioning of a hydropower project, given the type of permitting that's required, uh, especially around environmental sensitivities. And um, you know, as, as more and more communities um, or states or even countries start making very um, aggressive sustainability goals, going to 100% renewable or going to um, a carbon-free future, the question is, where is this energy going to come from? Um, it's unfortunately not going to come from hydropower, given that the average age of a hydropower dam in the US is now over 80 years old. Most likely, it's going to come from something that looks a little bit like this. Now, can we see a show of hands of people who have actually touch and feel things like this on a more regular basis. Yep, I see a lot more hands in the room. And there's a good reason for that. These systems are cost effective. They're rapidly manufactured. They're able to be installed very quickly. They're standardized. They're modular. They're replicable. Um, there's many, many exciting things about solar. You have a lot of other things to add into. I think there, you know, there's a lot of good attributes about this. Um, and you know, most importantly, the cost is being driven down, so we're actually able to acquire these types of systems more cost effectively. Um, you know, however, we know that these systems don't operate 24-7. We know that we can't control when the sun shines. Uh, we can predict it, but it's, we can't turn it on at our 6 p.m. evening peaks or things like that. And so there are some inherent challenges related to the intermittency of systems like this that you see here. Um, despite that intermittency, you know, it's, uh, it's projected that by 2022, almost 90% of all new renewable capacity that's coming online is going to be either from wind or from solar PV. Um, so we see this, you know, we see this growth not just on our rooftops, uh, but also in the data, as you see here. And so when we look at how hydropower just is not able to keep up with the, you know, eclipsing amount of solar and wind that's coming online, you know, we have to be asking really tough questions of what do we do about having a sustainable grid 24 hours a day um, with intermittent renewables? Um, we, there's a lot of conversation about energy storage, uh, mostly still chemical options. And the, we all know that the pricing 
of those types of systems is not where it needs to be to be able to have a sustainably renewable future. So we see water movement as the world's natural battery. Uh, we have water infrastructure, particularly um, in our case, we focus on water infrastructure as opposed to natural rivers and streams for many of the reasons I mentioned earlier about permitting timelines and environmental sensitivities and wildlife uh, protection. We see water infrastructure as a source of natural energy storage that should be able to be tapped into for our use. Um, these are areas that you cannot build a conventional dam. They don't have major elevation drops um, or even you know, small elevation drops. These are the kinds of, uh, of waterways that must continue to run in order for our crops to be uh, irrigated, in order for people to have um, drinking water and you know, do, uh, to serve many other uh, commercial or industrial purposes um, around the country. And so what, what we're doing here at Emergy is we're taking a product style similar to solar and wind that is repeatable, that is modular, that is standardized, that is able to be manufactured um, at rapidly and at low cost, but applying it to a medium that is controllable, that's reliable, that's uh, able to be harnessed uh, and applied for our good. And so this is a photo of one of our systems that's here installing, or that is here operating, um, only about 20 miles from here in South Boulder. Um, so this is an energy asset owned by Denver Water. Um, this water here that you see going through the turbine uh, will eventually become drinking water. So you can feel proud that perhaps some of the water that you've had to drink in Denver metro area has actually been used to generate clean energy in distributed hydropower first. Um, and essentially what we do is we have developed a low impact way to distribute hydropower along these channels as opposed to centralizing it in one major facility, which is what hydropower has traditionally been about for um, hundreds of years now. So this is a municipal water supply canal. So there are no fish or wildlife in this channel. Um, and that's another reason why we focus so closely on water infrastructure as opposed to rivers and streams. These are all brownfield developments, all retrofits. Um, we don't put these you know, in the stream behind your house or, or anything like that. Um, that said, I will talk as we look at the technology about um, attributes that we've included in the system for uh, wildlife compatibility, uh, although we, um, we don't target those areas whatsoever. And so, you know, when you look at the intermittent alternatives and distributed energy uh, versus a distributed hydroelectric opportunity, what's important to note is that all types of distributed energy can essentially achieve the same amount of capacity um, just depending on how many modules you install. Depending, you can have a, an, um, a comparable amount of solar panels, wind turbines, and distributed hydropower modules. But the interesting thing about hydropower is that it can run almost all the time. Um, these water supply canals can often you know, can be running 24-7, um, or perhaps they come down for maintenance a couple of times a year. But if it, say, ran 80% of the time, which is what you see here, then over the course of the year, that same investment into the same amount of power for wind, solar, or hydro is going to result in far more energy over time than the other alternatives, just because the resource is there more often. And so this is just an illustration. Not all canals are, are the same, um, and obviously some areas have better solar resource or wind resource than others, but uh, the opportunity for using distributed hydropower to be that combination of both stored energy and energy generation is an exciting opportunity um, for hydro in general. So let me tell you a bit about our specific project. Um, we deliver product that is fully assembled and ready to be installed. Um, this is, uh, you may actually recognize 
this vista, if you've done any uh, hiking or um, biking around Ralston Reservoir here, um, this is, as I mentioned before, Denver Waters property, um, not too far from here. But essentially, you know, one of the important parts about distributed hydro um, is we have to take those lessons from solar and from wind and having something that is ready to be installed when it arrives. Uh, most conventional hydropower is constructed at the site and assembled together um, to become a construction project. Uh, when we look toward distributed renewables, these systems have to be brought in, installed quickly, and interconnected quickly. Um, with the smaller power densities, there isn't enough, say, uh, capital cost in the, and budget in the project to be able to spend lots of time uh, building up things on site. So um, at Emergy, we've partnered with GE Hydropower. They manufacture our turbines for us. And so when we deliver product, um, it comes straight from their facility on a truck that can be driven up right to the side of the canal. Um, that's another uh, important attribute about uh, water infrastructure is that they have very good accessibility for heavy equipment, for electrical interconnection, and for delivery. Um, we don't want to drive these kinds of trucks all through, you know, the, the hills behind our house or anything like that. Once it gets to the site, we simply lift the unit off of the truck, place it right down into the channel. Um, it comes in a fully self-enclosed precast concrete box that is made of the same concrete that lines the canals. So we know it's going to live for a very, very long time. It's going to be robust. And um, it includes everything needed to be able to keep the shafts plumb, to have everything pre-tensioned and pre-tightened. And essentially, we have here two twin vertical axis turbines. These are kinetic turbines rather than pressure-based uh, turbines. So these really capitalize on simply the flow of water through the channel, not on head pressure or on an elevation drop. Um, so essentially, these two work in tandem. They are hydrodynamically optimized to work together. Uh, and actually, you know, the, um, the efficiency of both of them next to each other is actually higher than just one uh, or two on their own. And so we, we've essentially dropped this full system right into the canal using a very simple uh, crane like you see um, on the right there. We actually did rent this crane, uh, but Denver Water actually owns a crane on site that can be used to move these in and out of the channel as they please. And then we just send, sit them right down onto the floor of the channel. We don't modify the structure in any way. We do no, uh, we don't um, do any anchoring. We don't do uh, any diversions or any uh, additional changes to the channel whatsoever. So once they're installed, they simply sit there. They're held down by their own gravity and are unable to move um, with worst case water flows. And then as the water gets turned on and flows through these units, we scale up the power capacity by putting arrays in series uh, inside of canals. And so it's intended to be an extremely low impact solution um, where you can place them right down in the channel and connect the units together, aggregate the power, deliver that back to the grid or uh, to a net metering or behind the meter arrangement um, with the water asset owner. So I'll walk you just briefly through some of the uh, technological features that make uh, our distributed hydro um, option unique. We essentially, our, our product consists of three major subsystems. We have our flume, the precast concrete structure I mentioned before. We have the hydrokinetic uh, assembly, and then we have our power system. So when we look at the flume, it's intended to be very simple. This is our gravity base. Um, beyond that, though, we do do some uh, engineering, and, and a lot of engineering is embedded into these systems to keep them very simple. Um, as I mentioned, this is a hydrokinetic system, meaning it operates based on the flow of the water. So you can imagine it much more similarly to a wind turbine than perhaps to a hydro turbine. So in wind, the faster the speed, the more power you get, which is exactly the same principle here. And so what you'll see is we've actually created and uh, engineered 
a radius, a hydrodynamic radius inside the concrete wall that acts as a flow accelerator. You can see here in the top image a velocity gradient without any acceleration uh, using the concrete. Here, what you see is once we radius in this concrete, uh, a really high acceleration of velocity right where the turbine comes and harvests the torque that's going to be converted into electric power. Um, simple designs like this have allowed us to really increase the power density of these seemingly very simple units. And so this Flume is actually a very important part of our product, not just from the standpoint of maintaining our customers' wishes, that they maintain the integrity of their canal in full. They still have everything uh, ready and, and able to operate the water flow as needed for municipal or agricultural purposes, but yet we're also able to use it um, from a performance standpoint, adding to the power density of our units. When we look at the turbines, we have, um, spent hundreds of lab tests and simulations looking at how we can utilize a vertical axis system rather than perhaps what you may have seen in other concepts of you know, horizontal axis looking like a wind turbine, a true wind turbine, um, to be as high efficiency as possible. Uh, we believe that vertical axis is, um, is the most applicable type of system for distributed hydro in that it's able to maximize the water column while also take advantage of um, the, the mechanism of how the water flows through the channel. And so uh, we have a whole team of hydrodynamicists who have assessed many different turbine types. Um, and we spend a fair amount of time not just looking at how the turbines interact, but also how the series will interact. When you think of, you know, when you drive by the NREL site close by or other wind farms and you see the orientation of different turbines to be able to take advantage of the fluid as it moves through a series of of um, different operating machinery, our system works in a very similar way. So we configure our arrays in a very specific way so that that way, um, as water flows through, we're able to capitalize on the wake of each unit, um, either in front or behind, and optimize the power performance. Um, interestingly, we've been able to demonstrate here in Denver different operations in flow regimes where perhaps um, we, you know, this, this year, actually, here in Colorado, um, there was a series of wet months where we were getting so much water flow, um, water into the Ralston Reservoir, that they actually didn't need to run the canal upstream, which is where our turbines are. So we fell into quite a low flow regime for a series of weeks and months. And one of the you know, interesting optimizations that came out of this was we were able to take some of the downstream units and overspeed them, almost operating them like a motor, and bringing water levels up you know, in front of them, adding a bit of blockage there, bringing water levels up just a couple of inches to push those units upstream into their optimal operating range. And so there are, um, there are array dynamics that we are on the forefront of discovering to how you can utilize these systems in connection with the clients. Uh, because one of the unique parts of this type of industry is that it is, while there are weather impacts, just as I mentioned, having excess rain in downstream reservoirs or things like that, there is a whole aspect of operational efficiency and operational excellence that can be achieved to be able to run the canals for power generation. Um, and to be able to coordinate the operation of these systems with the water asset owner's operations in general. So that as when they fall into that low flow regime, the next time around, we can already proactively anticipate that, begin to operate in that mode, and be able to maximize the amount of power that they're able to get out of that uh, in light of the, the operational um, uh, regime that they have. So moving on to the power system, I've decided not to bore you with a long electrical diagram of how these systems actually come together and, um, and aggregate power for the grid. Um, but you know, what I decided to show you here is something 
very simple. You know, it, the electrical side of the business is not an area that we innovate. Um, we focus our, our innovation on how we take energy that's inherent in water flows, how we convert that into meaningful, usable energy uh, for our customers. And everything from these very simple off-the-shelf induction motors um, to the grid is all commercial off-the-shelf um, technology. Now, of course, we embed our control systems that uh, perform these array controls and optimizations on them. But in fact, we're using one of your ABB uh, units in a, in a very simple NEMA 4 enclosure to be able to perform those um, those activities on onto the units. Uh, so you know this is an area where we want to we really want to focus on um, developing distributed hydro in the most sustainable way possible without introducing any new risk to the grid um, or to our customers who need a very reliable power system. Um, interestingly, you know, I was having some conversations before this talk out in the atrium, and we were talking about why this technology um, or distributed hydro didn't have a robust industry the way that distributed solar or distributed wind does, and you know, sort of why, um, that, why this is a, a still a very new concept. And um, while hydro has been something that is obviously been invested into and researched for many, many years, as it is the oldest form of renewable energy, distributed power systems um, are you know, a fairly new thing from a grid connection standpoint. And so really um, the development of the, the power systems, I'm sure when you, you know, many of your ABB systems like the ones we use, certainly weren't developed for distributed hydropower um, and probably were, de were developed for other distributed systems. In fact, uh, we began using um, the configuration that we have based on recommendations from some of the NREL wind professionals and being able to take from more mature industries, take from over-invested industries um, to apply here is something that has really enabled distributed hydropower to be able to be a commercially viable um, option. Before this uh, and before solar and wind were um, we're able to uh, invest and develop those types of grid side infrastructure. It was very, very difficult to be able to, uh, to successfully and sustainably deploy a system like this. So um, all that to say, the power system is where we try to keep it very simple and learn and take from the other industries that have done it far better than we could uh, invent on our own. So summing that all up, you know, what, what ends up happening is um, our units are about the size of a large SUV, say the size of a Hummer. Um, and we deploy them in twins, as you can see here, uh, for all the benefits that I mentioned before. Um, they're intended to be very simple. They're intended to uh, be able to integrate seamlessly into existing flows of water um, and, you know, to, uh, to be something that seems very familiar when I have many, you know, clients who uh, will look at something like this and say, you know, this looks like, you know, you can fill in the blank, something that you recognize. It looks like a, a pinwheel that you blow or it looks like an egg beater. It looks like, you know, something that you can, you can imagine um, and that you've seen working in operation. And when you see it turning in the water, um, it's very familiar as opposed to perhaps something that is a black box you know, in a canal that you don't know exactly what's happening there. Um, our goal is to keep it as transparent and as simple as possible. So I'm sure you're wondering, you know, where is all this infrastructure that we can put these? Um, and we have the same question. Unfortunately for us, we don't get to go to the NREL website and type in uh, latitude and longitude and have you know, all of the distributed hydro locations spit out for our convenience. If anyone here works at NREL, please tell them that we would love to have something like that. Uh, maybe I should go to the JCRES and tell them that this is what we need. Um, so um, what we've done to try to understand what this opportunity is, is, you know, we start with DOE, uh, you know, estimates on where hydrokinetics could be applied uh, both you know, globally in terms of 
both on onshore and offshore opportunities. Then we, you know, said you know, that doesn't really make sense because we're not we're not an ocean technology. We're not trying to put this out there. We got to narrow that down. And so then we looked at you know, rivers and streams, and we're really not looking at rivers and streams. We want to find the infrastructure of where we can install this. And so instead, you know, what I ended up doing, I think I lost the award for best boss of the year, is I had an army of interns that mapped every single mile of water infrastructure in GIS by pulling in information from the US Geological Survey that's released every five years and actually um, transcribing or translating both GIS or USGS data with Google Earth resources to map out uh, all of the characteristics about these sites. These are, you, know, you can see California here. We have uh, Washington. Um, and essentially, we're working our way west to east, mapping every water infrastructure location um, that is ripe for distributed hydropower. Uh, what we do is we take in all of the USGS data. We then filter through to only artificial uh, streams of water. And then we run that through a nine criteria algorithm that includes, you know, is it concrete lined? Is it free of fish and wildlife? Is it used for navigation? Is it close to power grid um, inner ties? Is it um, free of debris? Is there, uh, you know, does the, uh, we also overlay a spatial analysis tool to understand what the slope of these channels are, to understand how, how sizable and how compact these series or arrays can be. And essentially what we've now garnered is a database of about 15,000 miles of water infrastructure here in the US that's been pre-screened for distributed hydro. Um, this is something that we'd love to potentially uh, eventually um, share with broader communities, and we hope that this is the, the start of the development of an industry. Um, but so far, we've had to sort of define this from the ground up in the absence of, of cited references. Um, you know, that may seem like a lot, 15,000 miles, uh, but you know, when you uh, can look at other, uh, other countries around us that also have significant agricultural uh, infrastructure, um, you know, it, there is, uh, we, I was just talking with some folks from Taiwan last week where there's 68,000 kilometers of uh, concrete lined agricultural uh, infrastructure there. Uh, you know, our neighbors to the south in Mexico, uh, something around 40 to 50,000 uh, kilometers of water infrastructure. And so while, you know, maybe Distributed hydro isn't necessarily these huge figures that are coming out of DOE reports for what the oceans or the tides may be able to offer us in hydrokinetics. Infrastructure is a fabulous place to start building an industry, building a mass of distributed power resource that can really move the needle for, toward a more distributed, sustainable grid and sustainable future. Um, and so we hope to be on the forefront of that um, and hope to see a lot of additional development um, around that here in the US and globally as well. So looking at this database, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about how we, you know, practically how we site locations for distributed hydropower. Um, you know, the modules, as I mentioned, don't use any uh, anchoring or other type of construction. And so fitting them into channels that are sort of box shaped, that are almost like a chute versus your traditional sort of trapezoidal irrigation channel, or even uh, earthen lined um, channels can be applicable. You know, we really look for sites that aren't aren't tiny ditches though. You know, as I mentioned, our twin system is about the size of a Hummer. So if you think when you see these types of channels, you know, could a car, or could an SUV sort of fit down in there? That's really the meaningful size that you need. Um, you could certainly do smaller systems, and I'm sure some of you have probably seen the YouTube or uh, viral videos about the camping style sort of floating buoys that can charge a cell phone. Um, of course, you don't need a large channel for that, but what we're trying to do is not necessarily um, assist in 
uh, in off-grid living, but, but develop a more uh, sizable um, alternative to your distributed solar and wind. So we're looking at megawatt, multi-megawatt installations. And in order to do that, you really need a sizable unit that can capture you know, at least seven to 10 kilowatts uh, per module. And then you need to multiply that by 100 units to really get to that sort of megawatt scale. And so we seek you know, sites that have the appropriate uh, sort of dimension to fit a car, um, three to nine feet of water depth, you know, where, where places where you can have equipment, um, heavy equipment come in and actually deliver and install these systems and the access to the power grid. Once there are sites like this, then we run a series of hydrodynamic uh, and hydrostatic uh, simulations to look at what is the power potential in these types of sites. And so we look at the slope of the channel, we look at the discharge, and we're able to put together a flow profile and overlay that with an energy profile that distributed hydropower could achieve. Um, we use, this is an Army Corps uh, software called HECGRASS that some of you may be familiar with. It's used in, um, in hydrology quite often. Where's my hydrologist around here? There she is. Um, and you know, then we, we work directly with water asset owners to, mic to microsite each of these units to, to have an optimal array. You, know, you may be wondering, well, why are these closer together and why are these further apart? That's really where Emergy excels in our intellectual property. So I know I've talked a lot about how this is super simple and anyone can do it, but you know what, under really understanding how the slope of this channel changes over the, over the operation of the fluid and understanding where water accelerates, where it slows down based on geometric changes or elevation changes to be able to optimize the power output of a system while, um, while minimizing the Im hydraulic impact or um, the, the impact on water levels is, is um, a very complex equation that is um, done through more sophisticated modeling. And so, you know, we hope that one day um, we can refine this process to something that is very um, rinse and repeat. Um, you know, I, I was talking with someone recently who was telling me that, you know, the first time they installed solar uh, panels on their roof, it was, you know, 20 years ago and they had four different site measurements, uh, four inspections. They had all kinds of simulations looking at the angle relative to the, uh, to the sun. And you know, now they just replaced their system and they had you know, one you know, intake form on a website and it was optimized and done. And so we do hope that there is optimization in this process that eventually, especially as a distributed hydropower industry really develops at um, the ability to site in a more uh, convenient, more straightforward, quick way will be developed. But today, we do um, a good bit of hydrodynamic analysis on every single site. And so um, we talk about job postings. We're always looking for uh, folks who can help optimize this process as well. Um, and so, you know, from there, once we site out the, the um, the array, then I'm sure you're wondering how much does a system like this cost me? And you know what, we continue to make the automotive analogy where um, you know, these are about the size of a large SUV and they cost about the same as a large SUV as well, um, you know, between forty dollars and $50,000 a piece on the equipment side. Now our new partnership with GE, um, we hope will reduce those costs much quicker than we could do on our own because of course they've got a little bit more buying power than a tiny company out of Atlanta asking manufacturers to make our equipment faster and cheaper. Uh, but you know, as we continue to drive this down, what's important to note about this slide is not the actual numbers because the truth is, is that every site is different and we really, we do a customized proposal for every site. So it's important not to get hung up on the, the specific numbers. But what's really, what this slide is intended to illustrate <coughs> is that even though the cost of the equipment is gonna be a little bit more, a, little, a bit higher than say your average solar panel, or solar equivalent, 
um, what you see is that we are really targeting areas where we can install these and they're gonna operate 80% of the time or more. And if that can be achieved, then the cost of energy per kilowatt hour can be really competitive for a distributed system. So I'm not talking you know, multi-gigawatt utility installations here. I'm talking behind the meter or net metered in medium scale installations. Um, this can be an extremely economically competitive solution in areas where water flows um, uh, often near continuously or continuously. Um, when you compare that with similarly sized medium scale um, uh, you know, alternatives, it becomes very competitive, even though um, it is a, a new and emerging industry. So we work with customers really in two ways. Um, we, you know, water asset owners can invest in the array themselves. That way they, you know, often these types of water flows are um, owned by you know, either governments or quasi-governmental agricultural entities and who are making money today through selling that water, either selling it to uh, people like us for drinking water or they're selling it to farmland. And so you know, re-monetizing that infrastructure to be able to sell power uh, is a new revenue stream, a new opportunity. So we, we offer the opportunity to invest into the system and to be able to take the profitability from that over the long term. Um, this is, we use the same equipment as hydropower uh, in terms of shafts and bearings and gearboxes. And so the life cycle, while we advertise it to be 30 years, as you saw on the previous slide, should be, if properly maintained, a very long time uh, for them to be able to um, realize the benefit of hydro as they run their system. Or we also offer the opportunity for them to simply host an array. So that would be similar to other types of renewable project development where they would offer um, the water flow and be paid essentially for a, a lease payment for being able to use that water flow. We would develop the project ourselves and develop the utility relationship or the commercial or industrial relationship for entities along the canal to be able to net meter or use this behind the meter. And at the scales we're looking at today with sort of you know, from the 100 kilowatt to two megawatt range, this makes uh, the most sense for us to be looking at net metering and behind the meter opportunities. So that's a brief overview of who we are um, and our view on distributed hydroelectric power uh, as we see it today. Obviously, I'm one person uh, in, the, in this emerging industry, so I'm sure there are many other ways to um, develop or invest into uh, the development of distributed hydro. And I'm um, happy to, to open a conversation or a dialogue across the room with any questions that you might have or um, any other topics that we may want to cover for distributed hydro as well, because I think we have a good bit of time to do that. Yes. Can you tell us more about the generators themselves? Are they, do they have the built-in inverters? Or? Yeah, so today what we're doing, as I mentioned, we are keeping things super simple. So we have, we use a top, every system is um, a, a 480 volt, three phase AC induction motor. Um, we use those both as generators and as motors. So motoring is actually uh, the best way to clear debris, uh, interesting fact. Um, so essentially we take this wild AC that's coming uh, from the variable frequency um, of operation. We use an ABB uh, drive that is um, acts as our, what we call our turbine controller. Every turbine has its own controller that is essentially an ABB drive um, that it does both rectification and inversion in the same box. Um, so that conditions the power there. It also allows us to maintain the optimal rotation speed relative to water speed and control the performance. Um, from that box, it's, it, it's with you know, some auxiliary equipment in a, in a NEMA 4 enclosure that um, can sit either atop the unit in the canal or on shore. And essentially coming out of that is 480 volt three phase conditioned power 
that we can run either directly to a behind the meter application or aggregate along the channel um, to, a, to a more um, sort of grid side switch gear. Yes. Can you talk more about the, the competitors in this space that you, that you know of? Yeah, so um, to be honest, you know, there are, um, there's two ways to define competition, right? One, I think traditionally people look at competition as what technologies look the same um, or who's developing similar technologies. And on that, to answer that question, you know, most of the folks uh, who are focused on hydrokinetics are developing it in an oceanic or international uh, focus. And the reason for that is that the prices uh, for power, feed-in tariffs, are um, much more attractive for hydrokinetic in oceanic environments in Europe and Asia. Um, so a lot of the folks, even folks that have developed um, isolated pilots here in the US, for example, there is uh, a, d a pilot that was developed with the US Bureau of Reclamation back in 2012 in Washington State. Um, the owner of that company, I've, I spoke with him in the last year and he told me that they're over in Scotland, I think it is, you know, trying to get in on, uh, on the oceanic environment. Um, um, so it's really hard to compete with higher priced, you know, product in an area where prices are going uh, further down all the time. Now, where we see competition is not necessarily whose products look the same, but who is offering solutions to the same customers that we are. And it's very rare that I walk into a water district that says, oh, I've been, uh, I haven't ever thought about renewable energy before. Everyone I've talked to, of course, says, well, you know, the solar salesmen tell me I can get this, or the, you know, wind people say I can get this, or, you know, there was someone who came here and wanted to build a dam on my canal, and I couldn't do that. Um, there are proposals to cover canals with solar panels, um, which is, um, of course, feasible from an engineering perspective, but these canals are actually quite interactive. The, you know, they have to maintain them and have access to them, so uh, that hasn't gained much traction yet. Uh, but it's it's a very real proposal and a very you know it, solar can be very cost effective. Um, so we would see typically customers are not choosing between our flavor of distributed hydro and XYZ. Uh, distributed hydro, typically they're choosing between um, a solar option and, uh, you know, potentially something like this, or um, actually one of the more common things is um, trying to pool their resources to be able to buy into a giant utility scale, either solar or wind opportunity that is uh, potentially quite far away from where they actually are. Not much. Um, but, you know, it, there, is, there is advantages and disadvantages to that, right? It's, it, we, of course, are enjoying the opportunity to have some first mover advantage and to be able to have a, a commercially available option for this. However, you know, there's a reason why, you know, solar could never have gotten to the pricing that they have gotten to now if there wasn't a whole industry, a whole development of, um, lobbying efforts and collective uh, collective activities to bring that solution to where it is now. And so it's very hard to imagine distributed hydro becoming that competitive when there's one company, you know, singing out in the distance wanting to wanting this. And so, you know, we are really um, encouraging and trying to help build a community of distributed hydropower believers and, you know, encouraging of trying to get different methods in there. Because while we have spent uh, five years and, you know, in terms of research, much, much longer uh, developing what we believe to be the best technological product, there's many ways um, to convert uh, energy and water into electric power and to be able to do it in a low impact way. You know, hopefully um, more people will, will be able to jump in on this. Yes. Uh, what kind of computing power do you need to uh, to model 
that uh, flow and uh, how to space those? It's a great question and one that I wish I had one of my fluids folks here with me. Um, we use a, um, a cloud computing service. Um, it's a fluids program, that, uh, a CFD program called SimScale. And it basically is an open foam uh, base with a wrapper. Uh, and we do all of our computing um, in, the, in the cloud. And so it's a, it is a lot, we sort of burn through core hours, uh, unfortunately, a lot faster than I would like to. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, we're still also we're still very intensive about uh, performing detailed simulations of every single site that we look at, and we hope that you know as we develop more operational history, more um, field data that can be replicated and translated into new opportunities that we won't have to be so intensive on that. But today we are. We use we use um, fluid dynamics modeling both for uh, site development and for the sales effort, as well as obviously for product development too. So, yes. So like you control the motor? Yes. You don't do that remotely? Yes. So each unit is connected? Yes. More. Yeah, so in addition to each unit having a turbine controller, there is one at the, at the grid connection point, we have a, an array controller that essentially allows for dynamic control, but as I mentioned, in those high or low flow regimes to be able to control the different um, machines relative to one another. Yes? Does water flow 100% of the time? It depends on where you are, um, you know, and, and it's a very interesting, um, um, you know, m macro dynamic that books are written about. And, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, some folks in this room have studied water development in the West and water rights. And so uh, in, in our world, it's a very fascinating, um, you know, uh, selection of target clients and target markets because we're not just looking at where does what rain fall or where are weather patterns uh, attractive. We're looking at who has contracts to run water 24-7 and who has um, you know, federal contracts because those are going to be more uh, sustainable long term than say fishery contracts or other potentially uh, seasonal type of contracts. Um, there are some variations regionally. Uh, you know, if you're going to be, if you're down, um, you know, in the extreme uh, southwest, uh, you're, there's several bureau and other canals that are running almost all year round. Several of our clients in Arizona, they shut out just for two weeks a year just to clean things out and keep running. In other areas, um, you know, here in Colorado, it's much more seasonal. Uh, in Central Valley of California, you see a relatively seasonal water year between February, March to September, October. Um, and then, you know, there's different uses of water too. So uh, all of those examples I just mentioned are roughly all water conveyance for the purpose of irrigation. Um, another great application of this that I didn't even talk about in this uh, presentation is the integration of these uh, systems at existing hydropower facilities um, in tail races or in intakes. Um, this is a great application to add capacity to an existing dam um, without, you know, um, uh, in compromising the integrity of that dam. And that's, uh, that is very centrally what we're looking at particularly internationally, uh, because those areas are so well de de uh, developed already. And in those cases, those systems are already operated for the purpose of generating power. So they may not be continuous, but they're operated based on power markets and when pricing is most attractive for generating power. And so um, we hope that over time, we through the introduction of these systems, we can show water owners and water companies that are moving water, that there are advantages to selecting when and how and how much water to run uh, within, of course, the confines of being able to complete the delivery, the water deliveries that they need to. But, um, but yes, it, it's, a, it's a spectrum. There are many continuous flows, but there are many, many uh, seasonal or non-continuous flows too. Yes. So do you look for um, pump stations? to power with your 
distributed. I mean, yep. use it locally mm -hmm. rather than Yeah, absolutely. Those are excellent opportunities for, for this. And that's really where you see, you'll find farmers who have, are using diesel for that. Or, um, you know, it's, we see a lot um, of diesel usage rurally. And to be able to replace that diesel with even just one of these is an excellent um, you know, statement of sustainability. And, um, and you know, what's challenging for us is that the sales process for that is very different, going and finding individual farmers who not only have the ability to make those purchasing decisions, um, but have the permissions to do that too. And so I would say we, as a company, are a bit less focused on that. But partnering with dealers or partnering with folks that supply um, those types of generation systems is absolutely a great opportunity. And even some of our irrigation districts um, use it to power their pumps or their wells um, as opposed to you know, conventional means. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this and how did you settle on the vertical axis rotor? So I am, um, I came into this business really from defense contracting. And in fact, Emergy's product started there. So we were building, I was building with a team of engineers, a solution very similar to this, uh, you know, based on this core technology for the US Office of Naval Research. And um, I became really personally inspired by what a modular technology that could do that was using water in a low impact way. And so um, as we were working on this, there was some interest from the Department of Energy. They also began to fund it, which at which point, if you know much about defense contracting, when things stop being defense, they stop being interesting. Um, and so it sort of sat on the shelf for about two years without any investment uh, before I finally said, hey, you know, if nothing's gonna be done with this, what would it look like if I did? Um, I was watching, you know, the exponential growth of renewables and being really excited about that and wanting to bring something that I felt was sustainable to the table. And so uh, what I did after two years is I went back to our old Georgia Tech hydrodynamics professors who had d originally designed this. And I said, hey, you know, do you wanna, uh, go in on this business with me and they said sure but you know by the way we're actually you know not even at Georgia Tech anymore and so um, they're still a part of the business and they are um, the hydrodynamic brains and fluid mechanics brains behind the vertical axis turbine and we've been um, we have been uh, pursuing the vertical axis arrangement since day one uh, based on their recommendation and they are uh, our our lead hydrodynamicist is now uh, the head of fluid mechanics at the University College London and is a well-known figure in um, hydrokinetics, both for tidal as well as for riverine systems. And so this is one that while, you know, you heard me already say, yeah, we are not oceanic, we're not offshore, um, this is already a bi-directional system that would have a natural evolution into that space if and when um, those types of systems become more uh, feasible. Yes? Is there a minimum size ditch in terms of uh, CFS that you look at applying this to? Yeah, so um, the most important um, variable for the performance of the system is the 2D inlet velocity uh, to, uh, to the turbine. And so essentially we look for, for sites that have a baseline flow velocity of between one and one and a half meters per second, and that's 2D. So then when you look at, you know, volume wise uh, for minimum size, I mean, you could take just one half and um, that's, you know, uh, 1.6 meters wide, and we have a 80 centimeter tall smallest rotor. So, you know, we can, whoever can do the math in here fastest for me, it's gonna end up being somewhere around uh, 150 to 200 CFS is gonna be sort of your minimum. Um, we prefer to have sites that have you know, more in the three to 500 range when you look at having the full double system um, and achieving those kinds of velocities. But there's other factors at play too. A higher slope uh, canal is gonna have higher velocities, shallower flows, and quite frankly, you know, 
it, the energy is still there in a different uh, in a different sort of configuration. And so we'll look at we'll look at everything and tell you. We have actually a very simple site checklist that you can fill out about a site that you may know, and we can tell you very quickly feasibility, power potential, number of units, and things like that. But really, sort of a minimum of 150 to 200 CFS. Can these things like Im get impeded for like if you're putting them too close together? Can, can you kind of like cause a backflow kind of situation? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really the example we give when someone says, "Well, hey, this looks super simple. What happens if someone copies it and just goes and plunks them in the channel everywhere?" And you know, there's there's a real risk to that. Uh, not understanding how the water flows and how to optimize the hydraulic impact. Um, not only statically but dynamically uh, is very, very important. Um, we do a lot, we take a lot of care in understanding um, the integration of this system into channels and if you put them back to back, you'd certainly choke the flow. And I see it's distributed mm -hmm. and I'm thinking through your whole talk, like this is really kind of transmission related because you've got to have wires, you know, and like you've got to, so, but what was also occurring to me is that, is this possibly um, a bridge fuel instead of gas? Is that, or am I way off? No, you're not way off. I mean, I think this, you have to look at the alternatives that are available to you in the, in the specific situation. And, and in some cases, yeah, this may displace a gas need that you have. Um, in this particular case, too, you know, Emergy as a small company, there's also, you know, uh, startup dynamics at play here, too. If anyone has started their own business before or has grown a business, you know that you have to find a way into the market that's not going to put you out of business in the process, right? And so as opposed to going and trying to sell, you know, one here that goes to this pump and one here that goes to this house and one here that goes to that, you know, we're, we are today very strict about approaching sites where we can develop uh, many systems in an array and have uh, one client that can manage all of that. Um, and so as a result of that, yes, you need to have the wiring to configure this whole array together. You need to apply it to the grid. Um, but eventually, you, you can imagine embodiments of this that would be direct connections or off-grid opportunities. It's just, um, it would be quite a challenge to be able to do that uh, sustainably today. But yes, I think you're right on track. Yes. I'm not sure I understand what, roughly, what potential do you see within the state of Colorado for the, for this technology? How important, how big a dent could it make? So that's a great question, and one that we are pursuing the answer to that to every day. I can show you, um, you know, the specific map that we've created of all of the you know areas of excitement. Um, and energy in canals around the state of Colorado. And we see um, a significant potential. Uh, I would say at this, at this time, it's more anecdotal than truly quantitative just because we are, it, it's taking us quite a while to actually crunch all of that power potential and then compare that to the overall energy mix. But you know, I talk to folks like um, uh, over at United Power, uh, who say, who have said to me, you know, our district isn't great for solar, it isn't great for wind. You know, if we're really going to be serious about renewables, we need to be thinking about something like this. Um, we're looking at projects from Grand Junction all the way. Um, we've got folks in Fort Collins today and tomorrow um, with irrigators there. And so we have identified and actually have, um, have, proposals under development on um, about a quarter to half megawatt right now, but it, it, obviously that is, we've been at this for months, not, not even, you know, really years yet, and we see the opportunity here to be um, several, several dozen times um, that which we've already even identified. Could you describe how expensive your uh, operation is with Denver Water, mm -hmm. and, and is there more exploration of Denver water infrastructure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this particular channel that you saw in the picture, um, it's nine miles long. It, span, it goes from Gross Dam to Ralston Reservoir. Um, it is, uh, we have 10 modules, 100 kilowatts in about 1,000 feet. 
So the opportunity you imagine for scaling uh, is quite significant. Um, and this particular site, like many in the Denver water system, because what they're doing is bringing water into the city for eventual drinking water treatment, um, is, is an operational opportunity as well. You know, today they, they operate really single-mindedly on water delivery. So they'll, you know, one day they don't send very much water. Another day, maybe it's a lot. And when you think about what the system actually is, it's one reservoir upstream, higher elevation, one reservoir downstream, lower elevation, and they're just maintaining levels. And so when you think about, you know, all the investment into pump storage and things like that, you know, this is a very similar type of operation where if you could really convince them of how they could optimize their power production by running the channel at more strategic times, um, it could be a really powerful uh, case study and power project. And that's one of, I think, um, seven major canals with Denver Water. And then also I was just with their uh, head of hydropower a couple of weeks back where we talked about four tail race opportunities as well in four of Denver Water's dams. And so um, there are, th the thing that I hope you're seeing here is that there's a lot of opportunity, but unfortunately it's because of the, the underdevelopment of the industry, it's having to turn over each individual rock everywhere that you go and trying to trying to map all of these out ourselves as opposed to really having a more proactive view on what the market actually is. One final question. Yeah. Do you have any idea about potential on um, <clears throat> the other side of the country by that vast collection system in the Fraser Valley? I wish I had a specific number for you. And when I come, maybe I'll come back to one of these meetings in you know, a couple of months and try to have uh, a more quantitative figure because it is something we work on daily. Uh, my interns hate me, but uh, it's a very important effort that we're working on to really understand that because we get, uh, we have a lot of um, inbound, you know, unsolicited interest of, of people working in that area and people working all over saying, why is this not more common? Um, so we hope that it will be. Yes. Uh, so I love the concept for all the reasons you mentioned, the modularity, the simplicity, the re replicability. Um, I have one nagging concern, and that's based on the fact that in, in the physical world, you don't usually get something for nothing. So the, the owners and, and operators of these uh, large distribution systems, what are they giving up as you extract a bunch of kinetic energy from them? So, and, I can see it like in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It, there's probably plenty of slope there, to, so it's not an issue. But in the plains and like the Central Valley of California, it's, it's pretty darn flat. Yeah. And they have, you know, lifting stations to, to keep the water moving. So, are you robbing Peter to pay Paul if, as you extract yeah. energy from the sea? It's a great question, and in some areas, yes. Like, for example, I was just with the Central Arizona Project a few weeks ago, um, which is, would, you know, when you look at it on space, it's like the holy grail for something like this. You know, massive canal system serving major parts of Arizona. And, you know, uh, interestingly, 100% of their water is pumped uphill. Um, they use massive amounts of electricity. They don't even, you know, at least in California, they're pumping up to overcome elevation changes that they have to, and then it flows by gravity down to the next pumping station with the next elevation change. Um, and that's really from, the, from a necessity to move to one location. But um, for example, this CAP, they're 100% is uphill from, from start to finish. Um, and so obviously, you know, we can't, work against their pumping activity to generate power, that would be, you know, that wouldn't work with the laws of physics, yeah. Um, and of course, you know, there are other areas, um, as I mentioned, slope of the, uh, you know, gravity is our friend. I mean, all hydro at the end of the day is working from some element of gravity. We are working on the smallest elements of gravity, not taking into consideration a major elevation drop, but we still have to have gravity. If you don't have any slope at all, then there is no, there is no uh, acceleration due to gravity of the water that can be you know, converted into energy. Um, and so you know, we prioritize sites that have a slope that, uh, a sufficient slope that uh, results in 
significant excess energy, but you know, different areas of the region of the country definitely have less, you know, potential than others. But then you have to ask the question of, okay, well, you know, maybe. Um, uh, what are the specific value propositions in these areas, and is it better for them to have a little bit of energy uh, or you know none? So uh, I think it'll be situational. But yes, I think you're you're absolutely right. We have to have the natural energy there. Estimation of what, what's the practical limit on let's say the percentage of uh, energy in the flow that you could remove without. Um, you know, it really varies. It, it, you know, not a, a, unfortunately, uh, as much as I want to create a cookie cutter solution that can be applied everywhere, no two water flows are really exactly the same, sadly, uh, for me. But um, you know, when you look at these sites, some some channels, for example. Uh, are, were designed by, uh, like CAP, for example, designed by an excellent engineer who doesn't have, you know, one percent of energy excess energy in that channel. Whereas there are others, um, you know, there are, uh, there's a site in Idaho we're looking at right now that has um, something like um, uh, 80 kilowatts of available energy, you know, per cross section that recover due to its slope, it recovers uh, through after going through our system in like seven feet or something, something like that. Um, so it's it's a highly highly excess energe energy site um, that can be extracted. So um, it's hard to put a sweeping number on all sites, but you know this isn't uh, this is something that is not too good to be true in the sense that every single channel you look at as you walk down the street isn't the perfect application for this. But there are many applications that when we take it through our nine criteria algorithm through our program seem to be um, you know, pretty attractive for power purposes. What happens when you have a flood? Do you have to curtail? Do you get too much generation? And also kind of be considered battery to back up? So um, another reason why we focus on infrastructure is that these systems typically have gates and other mechanisms that protect them from flooding events. Um, if there is an overflow of some sort, as I mentioned before, we can dynamically operate them to stall them um, or you know, keep them from running to make sure that they're not um, you know, overspinning or something like that. Um, and what was your second question? If you get too much energy yeah that's all regulated through the through, through the electrical system no grid would let us connect to them if we were going to just pour excess energy in there so we have voltage regulation and frequency regulation and uh, anti-islanding issues that keep and that from happening too much, do you use like micro batteries like for wind you certainly can um, we um, we currently, you know, advertise this as a storage-free system since we're using the natural st stored energy in the water. Um, but, you know, interestingly, compared to the alternatives um, with the more intermittent renewables, you have to oversize the capacity and store that in batteries for when you don't have generation. Whereas for this, if you needed something, um, if you were doing an off-grid system, uh, you could undersize the system uh, capacity because it's operating all night. You don't need that power and store that power instead. So it, the economics <clears throat> work out a little bit more attractively. Yes, I don't know where to go. Maybe these three. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the case of the demo water system, are they basically putting that energy into the grid? They are. Um, the special arrangements with Excel? Or? Yeah, so that's been... Um, it's been quite complex. Um, and it's still not done yet. Uh, basically, <laughs> to keep a very long story short, um, this was Excel's service territory, and United Power has been a really great uh, partner and potentially a long-term partner. And they just recently completed a real estate swap to swap service territories. Uh, so that this is now a United Power Service territory, and Denver Water will be net metering a United Power bill. Um, but it's, as you might imagine, those 
those types of swaps aren't exactly uh, quick and easy um, activities. So, but it'll be a net metered um, Denver water. As you may know, they're building the North water treatment plant there at the Ralston Reservoir site. And so it'll be a brand new water treatment plant. Um, while it does have a lot of energy efficiency uh, and generation technology there, it will still have an energy bill and this will be part of the, the um, uh, net metered consumption of that. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any concern about, you said you're, there's not much concern about someone coming in and popping these down and doing exactly what you do because you claim the things kind of, we understand the flow of the water and that's our expertise. What about someone cutting you on cost? Because right now you said that was a bit prohibitive. Have you had any issues getting contracts based on upfront costs? And if someone were to come in and say, you know, just mechanically design this for cheaper, or is there a concern there? Are you working to kind of cut the cost of these? Um, I would warn my customers to be wary of that um, because the cost driver in this isn't fancy components or fancy um, extras. It's the fact that when this runs continuously, it hits a million cycles in a month and a half. And so if you're going to just cobble something together and throw it out there, you're going to hit the fatigue limit on something like this really, really fast. And so most of the cost that's associated is in making sure that this is going to live and live for a really long time. On that point, what's the lifespan of an array, individual or maybe the system, and what's the maintenance update for here? Yeah, so um, in terms of lifespan, um, we use, as I mentioned before, similar um, components, meaning similar bearing styles, similar shafts and rotating components and gearboxes and drives and motors as other hydro. We're not using anything that's not you know, conventionally seen in hydro. And so if properly maintained, these should have an extremely long life similar to other hydro systems. Um, the, we do have a regular maintenance schedule. Um, you know, I think it's 40,000 hours or something like that for underwater maintenance given uh, given how infrequently sometimes these channels can be shut off. And then we have a more regular routine maintenance for above water, um, water maintenance. And that's uh, done either by us or a contractor or by the client. In fact, you know, Denver Water has many technicians who work out at this site. Uh, they service these themselves. Um, but you know, the, the goal is that this is a very robust piece of industrial hardware. Um, so while, um, Certainly, we may not be the lowest cost leader. One of the drivers for partnering with GE is so we can have the supply chain power, but also be able to still supply super robust equipment. Okay, yes. How does drought uh, history and current drought factor into it's a great question um, and one that we debate quite often, um, you know, because it's what we are tasked with doing is trying to work with customers to project how this may benefit them in the future. Um, one of the only ways that we can project the future is by looking at the past. Um, although I wish there was a better way because as we know, our water, our climate patterns are changing and um, what, we, what we believe we're gonna see are more extremely wet years and more extremely dry years, not so many moderate years based on the trends that we're seeing. Um, but when you look historically at a number of these sites, um, you know, California had its worst drought in history, you know, 2015, 16, 14, 15, and 16. And so, you know, there are challenges in how we use drought and water discharge histories to project the future. Um, we, we, are refining that every day. Um, in the event of a drought, as I'm sure we all know in renewables, no resource, no power. So no water, no power. That's unfortunately just the, the sad reality. Um, but you know, we, uh, of course, that's one of the values also of being an in infrastructure is um, the, the conveyance patterns and contracts that you know, are really sort of crucial to human health and to industry for water to run. And so even in uh, drought times, the major arteries of water, um, you know, typically are still feeding 
uh, feeding the channels or else we would be in a, a health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, so given the maintenance schedules that you just talked about, it sounds like these turbines are a lot less susceptible to the silt that might be carried and, and the wear that would occur to other types of turbines. Is that true? Um, we do have silt mechanisms built into the system um, because we do anticipate it. And, you know, clearly I want to be transparent that we don't have 10 years of operating history on these yet to really be able to tell. They may need you know, further maintenance. We may end up seeing more abrasion than we're expecting. There's still a lot to learn about this. And another area for good, bright interns and other engineers who are interested, uh, we have a site very close to here that we'd love to take more data on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that that's still to be seen. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some differences around sort of rotational speeds and um, you know configurations between bearings and rotor blades and things like that that are some you could make an argument that it is slightly different than other uh, types of turbines when it reacts to that, but not necessarily in a we didn't proactively plan for that. We just put conventional silt uh, you know extraction mechanisms into the into the floor. Mm -hmm. First off, thanks for a presentation on a emerging renew renewable technology. As a, first of all, really got an in-depth look at what you're doing. Uh, not really a two-part question, because two different ones. Uh, the first one is, is water rights and water law and that sort of thing an impediment or like keeping up with this train of thought and and accepting this sort of thing. And then uh, someone previously was kind of asking along the lines of, you know, the flux reduction of, you know, a train of these units. Uh, have you considered that as a possible flood mitigation benefit or something in the sense that actually slowing down water could have a net benefit in some place like California where the dam structures there are not necessarily dispatched based on power generation that are part of flooding? Yeah, um, great questions. Um, I'll start with the second one first. It, you know, we have not completed an in-depth study around um, water speed reduction, and uh, especially because depending on the slope, but the energy unfortunately recovers in a relatively short distance. Um, we haven't done an in-depth study of how that could be helpful. Potentially, if you did use many of these systems, um, you could see that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, although, unfortunately, in addition to that, you would see a propagation of upstream rise, too, so you'd have to sort of take both into consideration. But um, we have had um, you know, serious inquiries out of particularly um, flood-prone Latin American countries where they're looking for solutions that um, can accomplish both a desperate need for uh, clean energy as well as, you know, flood mitigation strategies. And we've looked at applications of putting these, you know, under uh, street, you know, flood grates where the, all the floods are, or flood waters are rushing, you know, underground um, to be able to help slow some of that down and take energy out. Um, and it's definitely a fascinating topic that we'd like to look further into but haven't uh, been able to really fully explore yet. And then related to water law and water rights, you know, when I started this business, I went and saw a colleague of mine who works in the solar industry. And uh, his quote to me was, you know, are you crazy? Uh, what we're doing is hard enough in developing these renewables, and you're going to go into a, an area where wars are fought over water? You know, this is insane. And so, you know, I was sort of prepared for the worst. And, um, you know, we still have yet to see it become a huge detriment um, or impediment to what we're doing. Um, there are definitely many complexities that must be understood around how essentially, you know, how all kinds of 
water rights, water wheeling, water sales. You know, this district works with that district and they have a handshake deal so their water flows aren't even shown in the contracts. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on that we have to become, we have to find expertise in um, to be able to really fully understand what our market potential is. Uh, but uh, it really, you know, we see it as an opportunity because this is a, it's essentially a feedstock for our system that is a commodity um, that could be harnessed for good. And so it's definitely far more com complicated than, uh, you know, understanding, um, you know, just when, the, when it might be raining or something like that. But, uh, but we have yet to see it become, um, you know, a, a sweeping impediment. For example, you know, FERC, uh, in terms of developing these systems uh, and selling the power, has already approved, far before our time, um, a qualifying conduit hydropower exemption to where hydropower built in water conduits for moving water from one point to another are, are exempt from having to go through FERC licensing up to a certain capacity. And so, you know, that's a huge facilitator for us that had that not been previously lobbied for and achieved, we might see that as a, as a big issue. And that's one of the reasons why we don't go into rivers is that that exemption doesn't exist there. Um, but um, that is a great question. Any other questions? Yes. So did I see in one of the first uh, films I saw is that they were counter-rotating? Yes. Yep, they, uh, you'll see here they counter-rotate. Um, taking into consideration the highest flow velocities on the outside of the turbine as a result of that acceleration of flow through the concrete. They keep it from creeping. But then you use only one, one component. Yeah, this was um, sort of a brainchild of mine. That is a whole chapter in the book of why I wanted to do it that way. Part of Energy's intellectual property portfolio is also a next generation uh, gearing and drive system that um, I wanted to put on these as well, but I knew I, they were too expensive to do two. So uh, I mechanically coupled them to be able to put one uh, to, to, for both turbines, but this actually is not how we build them now. Um, we use all the same stuff. We use dual drive just uh, to, to eliminate the mechanical coupling. Yeah, and you can see that in, our, in the renderings. Well, I really loved being here with all of you. I hope I was able to give you some insight into uh, distributed hydroelectric and our approach to it. Um, I have my business card and my contact information was on the last slide and I would love to hear any further ideas or references or people that we should talk to that you would recommend. Um, and I look forward to talking with you all either after this or um, hopefully in the future as we're building more of these systems.